Yeah, I can tell. I mean, you know, the chemistry is evident from the word go. So but also at home, like, obviously you bring some work stresses home and all that. I have to admit, like, there's no such thing as 6pm, we just don't talk about work. Lah. We even share it with our kids, so our kids are also involved. They're so smart, you know, they will give us suggestions, you know. Our, our kids are actually quite brutal because we would tell them that we have, you know, problems in certain parts uh, of the business and they would just tell us, well, it sounds like that person isn't doing well. Why don't you get a new person? <laughs> You're like, yeah, huh? <laughs> you know Welcome back to Do More, the channel where I talk to successful people about investment, entrepreneurship and leadership in Malaysia and beyond. My name is Ku Chong and I'm your host as always for the platform. Now, many of you know that I've been running this series with CGS, CIMB and Endeavour Malaysia where I talk to six of the country's largest and most successful entrepreneurs. The first one was with CY Lim of Yinsen Holdings Berhad. You'll find that interview in the playlist below. Now, this next episode is with a very interesting company called Fashion Valley. Fashion Valley was started over 10 years ago by this lovely, lovely couple, Faza Anwar and Vivi Yusuf. When they were fresh out of university, they've spent the last you know, decade and, and, a, and a bit going through this huge business roller coaster where they've had all kinds of ups and downs, travails, and adventures, and they share their life principles, their business principles, all while running uh, this company and starting a family. Now they've got four of them. So it's been a real adventure for them. It's been a roller coaster. They've endured huge challenges and, and, and travails, but they've been able to build a fashion valet into one of the country's regions and world's largest modest fashion platforms. If you do like this video, please do uh, share it uh, with your friends. Like it by clicking on the thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel. I'm trying to grow as much as possible with the channel. I hope it'll do a real service to Malaysia's business people and investment uh, landscape uh, and of course in, in your life as well. Stay tuned, take care, happy investing and uh, take good care of yourselves. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I, I think just the three of us are allowed to take our masks off. Our lives will look like um, we were Knievel and the best friends. Um, thank you all for coming. Especially Viv Vivi and uh, Faza, huge honour. Uh, honour belongs to me, obviously. Um, let's get the proceedings on the road. Um, both of you, famously, uh, you know, started this very successful business more than ten years ago. And I want to start by your your beginnings because when I looked at your profile, um, you know, you, especially both of you, right? Uh, Vivi, you, you're a law graduate from the London um, School of Economics, LSE. Um, you could have had a huge career in, in the law, in the corporate world. Um, Faza. Masters in Aeronautical Engineering from Imperial, one of the top 10 universities in the world, maybe top five even. Uh, you could have made a huge dent in whatever you both wanted to do, but you chose to start a business. Uh, I'm not sure what your, um, you know, what made you do that because, um, you know, obviously you could have a huge career. How, how did it all start? Maybe let's start at the start. You I, I definitely agree. It, huh? I definitely <laughs> agree that Vivi would have been an amazing lawyer. She's Aww. very good at arguing. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for having us here. Um, I I just came back from maternity leave, so uh, this is like the first talk in over a year. So I'm very happy to be doing it with you. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> so so straight into your question, right? Um, I uh, I can't speak for Fazza, but for me, I come from a, a family of entrepreneurs. My dad is an entrepreneur, so it's always like ingrained in me since young. Um, well, quite fun uh, to, to like create something out of nothing, right? Um, so even from school, I mean, I've told this story a lot. Uh, I, I would do, um, when teachers in front teaching, I'm like at the back uh, fulfilling my orders of friendship bracelets. They were cool back then um, uh, because I would take orders from people, you know, and um, it was really fun for me uh, being a businesswoman, even at the age of eight, right? And I would... I would write books because I love writing as well. And uh, I would force my friends to rent it for like 50 cents, you know, to read my book. And then I would, oh, okay, uh, I leave some pages empty and I would ask my, my friend who's good at drawing to draw on, on the empty pages. And then now my book is, if you want to read it, it's $1 because got pictures, you know. So, so um, I think from young, I've always enjoyed this a lot. Um, and I think... Um, if, uh, people who, kn who around me know that you know one day she's going to be an entrepreneur because it's what she's liked from from young. Faza, aeronautical man. I don't you could have, have done anything under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> really, from aeronautical engineering. Um, no, so um, 
yeah, I, I studied in Malaysia, did my O-levels here. You know, I was in international school um, my whole life, uh, from kindergarten all the way. And then at 16, uh, my it was almost, you know, like uh, very methodical. All of us got shipped off to the UK at 16, where we had to do our A-levels and figure out what we wanted to, to do with our lives. And you can imagine at 16, you have no idea what you want to do with your life, right? And so I was quite interested in, uh, in engineering. And so at, at the same time, I was also interested in, um, in business. So, you know, I thinking whether to do engineering or business, um, I, I read a lot about, you know, people going to uh, doing bis, uh, MBAs uh, later on in life, but they started off as engineers. So I think because of that, that sort of made me think, okay, you know what, let's do engineering because that's something that I really enjoy. And it seems like, you know, people, engineers are now going to every single field uh, available. So, you know, that made me feel like, okay, engineering is something that I really want to do. So when I came back to Malaysia, um, again, had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, so you do what, you know, anybody who doesn't know what to do does, and you join consulting, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I joined Deloitte Consulting. And yeah, within three months, you know, Vivi and I got the idea for Fashion Valley, and that's how the business started. It's worth uh, saying also, like, at that time when we were graduating from the UK was 2009, 2010, right? Um, and we couldn't get jobs there. I wanted to stay. I actually applied to, like, a lot of fashion companies there um, and got rejected. You know, so I'm like, Allah, you know, because I, I, I really wanted to stay on and, and gain experience there. But, you know, those rejections pushed me to, to clearly have, have this, you know, so, so it's a blessing. Yeah, London was a tough time in uh, 09, 010, financial crisis. Yeah. But uh, you guys have been in business over 10 years and you're still so young. It's, it's unbelievable. It's almost unfair. Um, <laughs> you know, it is. Um, so, so describe those early days, right? Um, building a brand is, is, is incredibly difficult, um, especially in Asia, where, you know, Asians love their mozzarella, you know, the Western brands and they're so entrenched, right? For, for you to overcome those early issues, how, describe those early days. I think those early days were the best because like we didn't know any better. It was like naivety was like a blessing because I really didn't think about ev all the things that you said because I was just an excited um, young entrepreneur wanting to create something, right? So um, there was no, you know, market research or whatever that we did or anything fancy. It was literally like, okay, I had a blog, I had readers um, and they seemed to like my fashion content. Um, we studied... Uh, in London, we learned about online shopping, came back here, we're like, hmm, like, why don't you just marry those two together? There's nothing like it here. So really, it wasn't about, um, you know, studying any market research or anything. It was literally what, just following your heart, you know, just following what you like. Um, and, and that's how Fashion Valley came about. Um, we thought there's something new that we can create, learning from what we've seen abroad. And then when we came back, we didn't have any products to sell, right? I just had my following, you know. Um, we have our law degree and an aeronautical engineering degree. <laughs> what, what, what do we do with that, you know? Um, so, so, um, so, yeah, so we thought, why not, um, since we didn't have anything to sell, why don't we cur curate products and put it on the website? Because we've seen something like that in the UK which was at that time ASOS, Net-a-Porte and all that. Um, and that's, that's literally how we started. And we thought that, oh, we, we, we have to buy all the products. Lah. So, so approach all the designers, we have to buy the products. And then suddenly, like one of, um, um, uh, one, one of my dad's managers said to me, why don't you consign, consignment? And at that time, I was like, what, 21? You know, like, what's consignment? You know, um, and they say you take people's products and 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 you sell them. If you sell, you 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 know uh, give uh, give commission to them. So you take commission. And you're like, oh, can I like that? I can just take and and not pay for it, you know. So so all these learnings along the way, and you're only 21, right? So you're figuring it out. But honestly, those days were were awesome. Uh, were the best days. Did you share that sentiment, Fatsa? Because you're like. <laughs> <laughs> Follow his girlfriend. <laughs> so, so when when we started the business, um, I I had my full time job at, at Deloitte, and um, and you know, 
try telling an Asian parent that you want to start a business with your girlfriend, right? I mean, you get slotted at home. So what, what I did was um, I would tell my dad that, you know, we, we had to start work very early, leave the house at 7 a.m., and at 7 a.m., by 7.15, we're in the Fashion Valley office. Uh, by 9 o'clock, I'm in the Deloitte office. And, you know, as any star employee does, by 6 o'clock, you leave the office. <laughs> and so back in the Fashion Valley office all the way till 1 a.m. And, you know, I have to admit that, you know, those early days, um, I was quite jealous of the fact that Vivi, and there was one more friend that was involved with it. She's here, actually. Yeah. Um, Asma. Yeah, nice and she... Up. <laughs> She's like, don't look at me. <laughs> yeah, so, and I was very jealous that they got to spend, you know, uh, uh, all of their time on the business. Because, you know, uh, before and after work, like, that was the only thing that I was looking forward to. Because it's true, you're on such a high because we were so, we were so committed to the business and we really believed that it was going to work. Because it worked so well in the UK. Right? And Malaysia was so far behind in terms of adopting e-commerce that that opportunity was almost like a no-brainer for us. So um, I'm sure it kind of all been like, you know, fresh air and sunshine and smiles all around, right? What were some of the most difficult times? How did you, how did you overcome those? No, I have to admit um, that, you know, for three 21-year-olds that started the business, um, within the first three months, we literally thought that we were going to be millionaires. I mean, the business was doing so well, like above expectations. Within the first, uh, within the first uh, 15 months, we already hit a million bucks in revenue, and it was still the three of us. And we were just like, oh my gosh, this is like a gold mine. Um, you know, literally... Gonna be rich. <laughs> gonna so be rich. Were you profitable from, from a very early time? I mean, we... I would say, yeah, we, we were uh, profitable from uh, from that moment. I think the, the part that really triggered us into thinking that, you know, we were sitting on a gold mine was when um, Rocket Internet started coming to Southeast Asia, right? And that's where you saw them pour hundreds of millions of dollars into the market. And we were looking at each other and saying that, guys, we've been so complacent, right? We've been sitting on this and we're not doing anything with it apart from you know just talking to designers and selling it online just going day to day trying to build the business that way we're not you know really we don't really have a plan of how to build it into a billion dollar business so i think that's that was the turning po the first turning point for us where we said that let's get serious with the business yeah rocket internet clearly the lazada they own lazada right the zalora's Zalora, of this lazada, world yeah. that that's either a a scary thing or a very exciting thing in, in terms of them opening the landscape for you guys, right? Then you think to yourself, well, these guys are massive, they've got lots of money, and you know, you're just starting out, albeit profitable already. What made you, or how, what kind of things did you do to scale up and you know, to try and, and you know, be competitive with the big boys? Well, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Like when, when, they came, when we started, we were the first. So we had the first mover advantage. You know, there was a lot of media coverage. Um, it was exciting because it was something new in Malaysia. But very quickly, there were so many companies that wanted to do the same thing. They would, and I would find out because they would uh, approach, uh, approach uh, the brands that work directly with me. So I would, I would know about it. I, and I'm very competitive. So I'm like, I gotta be number one. I gotta be number one. What do you mean you're talking to them? You know. <laughs> um, but suddenly. Um, they, w one of the brands uh, came to me and said, okay, uh, there, there was a company that approached me. They're from Germany. They're, they seem really big, and they want to buy all my stock. And, um, and I'm like, oh, okay, okay, now the big boys are coming. Um, and and it, was, it was scary. Um, we, we were spending about like 10000 20000 for marketing. That, that's it, you know, because um, we use social media a lot. We use Facebook at that time, Instagram, uh, my blog. So it was really, uh, like Fazza said, like, we, we took it for granted. Like, it, was, it was pretty uh, e easy to, to, to grow to a certain point. But then when big boys come in and they are approaching your bread and butter, your, your designers, right, the people who give you stock to sell so you can get revenue, you go like, uh-oh. You know, um, and they were offering much better rates than than us um, because at that time, I guess their 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 model was different, right? It wasn't to make profit; it was really to to gain market share. So it's like throw throw money, burn money, it's fine. 
Whereas for us, it, that wasn't the case. We wanted to be profitable. So um, we, it, it, was, it was tough. And, and it was like, okay, this, you're, you're offering me a 30% consignment. Um, this other huge giant's offering me 15. How, wh what do you do, right? So we thought that, okay, you know what? Um, we really need to raise funds. So that's what we did. We joined um, the uh, one reality show at that time, My AG Make the Pitch on, on TV. And um, uh, we, we thought, okay, if we get funding, great. If we don't get funding, at least we got marketing to be on TV, you know, which is something we can't afford. So might as well join this competition. At least people will know about us and hopefully convert into shoppers. Um, and that's exactly what we did. And we, we got the funding. First time um, getting, you know, talking, even talking about fundraising, valuation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All very new to me, maybe not to him, but to me. Um, and so we won. We won at that time a million bucks. And um, <laughs> we thought, okay, those guys, those big guys, they are everywhere. They spend everywhere, and they are always on digital marketing, um, always on Google Ads and all that. So we're like, okay, let's pour all of this into uh, ads. And we did that because we thought, okay, that's the right thing to do. My competitor's doing it. Okay, I follow. All money gone. The sales didn't come back. Um, you know, and, and people didn't convert. And we were like, what, what, what's happening? Like, well, what are we doing wrong? You know, and clearly, we didn't... We, we learned then we cannot follow competitors. What did you do wrong? How did you spend that million bucks? Okay, so... So, so I think you know the when when we when we started the business, the the differentiator for us was that we were going to uh, local designers. So these local designers were typically people who you have to go to and they make you know custom wedding dresses or custom evening gowns. And so we actually went to them and said that hey, we're starting this platform where we're going to put all the best designers on board. Can you make a diffusion line for us where it's cheaper? So when customers come to our website, A, they got all these great designers under a single roof, and B, they got you know, a different line which was a lot more affordable than what they would typically make. So there, there were these advantages when you, know, you shop on the Fashion Valley website. When we got the money, we realized that you know, the products that we're selling, if we wanted to scale 10 times, is not sufficient. And so we, we went out and started signing on many other brands, brands that didn't have the same kind of you know, prestige in their name as these other guys. And so we went from 100 brands to now like almost 400 brands. And most of them people didn't know. And there was no appeal to the end customer to you know, want to buy those products. Even if we spent, you know, like Vivi said, in the first year we spent 10, 20,000 in marketing in the whole year. And then after we raised money, we were spending 600,000 a year in marketing and customers just didn't want those products they wanted the prestige products or the products where it was cheaper to buy on our website right and we didn't have enough supply of those and then that became our next challenge of how do we start scaling the business because we had to scale the the right suppliers together with us so how would you advise entrepreneurs now to um, address digital marketing in a more clever way Every, you know, all entrepreneurs have got limited bullets, right? How would you advise them to spend their money more wisely in advertising today? Yeah, I think today, you know, digital marketing, you know, if you compare it to last year, uh, sorry, 10 years ago, is completely different because you're not competing against your own competitors. You're competing against all content, right? User-generated content, uh, paid content, um, you know, things that, Instagram, YouTube, you know, uh, uh, through their AI push to you. So you have to fight against all of that noise. I think, you know, being very targeted in your digital marketing in the sense where, yes, you have to pick the right customers, but you also need to ensure that it's part of a much bigger marketing strategy because digital marketing alone is not good enough to make your, your, your business uh, to the size that you, you expect it to be. I think one of the mistakes we made also was we did a one-size-fits-all kind of digital marketing. You know, like, oh, we did a banner, okay, a fa Fashion Valley is here, come shop. And then, 
you know, that everywhere. But um, then over the years, obviously, we, we hired uh, experts because I don't know anything about digital marketing, right? So I, I lean on my team. And then, you know, slowly you learn, okay, there are different content that goes to different segments. You know, if you want new customer acquisition, NCA is, a, is another type. If it's a promo, it's, it's specifically um, segmented. Um, if you want to target moms, if you want to target students, it's all different. And if you, uh, some ads are not for conversion. Some ads are for, for brand awareness, right? So we learned that, okay, you got to break them up into segments and judge them uh, accordingly, not like one size fits all kind of uh, marketing. Okay. And, and then when it comes to e-commerce, right, there's the back end. The back end can be a headache, right? Fulfillment, deliveries, returns, complaints. You know, for, for a small, almost underfunded business compared to like Rocket, how did you deal with those in those early days? <laughs> the early days, 2010, literally I googled how to set up website. you know. Um, and only one company came up and um, it's called NetBuilder. So, okay lah, call lah. Uh, I want to start this website. Can you help me? And they're like, sure, sure, sure. And they did uh, everything for us. Um, uh, I don't know if the company's still around. Oh, it's it's under MOL. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's under MOL. So so what? So we we basically outsourced the entire thing. But you know, so NetBuilder was uh, the e-commerce platform. But after that, you know, from the inventory to the um, picking and packing to the delivery. Everything was done on Excel, right? It was literally we in our business we get a lot of spikes. So in one day we can have like ten orders. Uh, the on a day where we launch a new product we could get two hundred orders. The day we got two hundred orders, we would call you know our helpers from the home. We would call our friends. They will all come to our office, and everybody would just be on the floor packing, right? And and we joke we joke about it now because. Last time when we used to get 200 orders, there would be you know, 20 people in the office on the floor packing until 2, 3 a.m. And so today, I think we've built our own, uh, our own systems where you know, everything is specific to our needs, how we pack, how we uh, inbound the items and where the items go, that we can do you know, 2,000 items, uh, sorry, 2,000 orders in a matter of six hours. Right. So I think we, we've managed to sort of build a lot of our own proprietary technology over the years because we were building together as it was scaling. And it's, it's for us, it's much better when it was in-house. A few years ago, we started doing it in-house. Because before this, you would have to um, just send an email, cut like the website crash. Because we, like Father said, we would have spikes, right? When we launch something, something um, people are waiting for. And... Um, when that comes, suddenly the traffic comes in and the website crashes. And you're like, you know, I just told everybody, you know, uh, that you can come and shop now, but you can't. So it, it was very frustrating and for us both not being in tech, uh, having tech background, you know. And that's when I was hit, like hitting myself like, why did I take law? Why didn't I take all? <laughs> you know, uh, I could do this myself, you know, but you rely on people. And this is the reality that everybody um, leans on tech talent. Tech is the enabler for everything, right? So um, it was tough in the beginning, but now I think there, there are so many, um, so many ways um, to, to, to get that. Yeah, so I think a large part of your success, both of you, comes from your social media presence, right? And Vivi, I think you're up there with Cristiano Ronaldo in terms of uh, <laughs> social media following at least, at least <laughs> 2 billion people now, right? Um, but the difference between you and Ronaldo is that you post yourself. You, you can tell it's you. I, you know, I've read your blog. It's very nice. It's written from the heart, yeah? Ronaldo wouldn't be writing about the cot that he just bought for his son. He wouldn't do that, right? But you did, you see? So, so... That's come with a, it's kind of like a double-edged sword though, right? It's been really, really good, but it's been really, really tough as well. Can you, can you talk about that? Sure. You know, uh, I, I love social media, actually. Um, it's what started uh, Fashion Valley, st what started Duck. Duck was born out of social media, right? So I'm very thankful for the existence of it. But at the same, and, and, and like anything, there are pros and cons. And the pros are really great. Like the moment you post something, like, you know, it, it, can, um, it can sell within minutes, you know. Um, and it does give you an upper hand when you want to launch something new uh, against other competitors who are starting out. 
But at the same time, you know, I don't know if you guys know me already, you would have probably known the scandals that come with it. You know, people just, you're, you're very vulnerable to, to attacks, right? Um, and people have seen you grow, you know, especially my blog readers, my followers. They have seen me since, like, study, uh, got married, started, started business, got married, got kids. They followed you along the way. So, in a way, they've invested so much in you that they feel like, they know you, you know, and, and they kind of um, own a piece of you, you know, and, and that's what you get for putting putting yourself out there, right? And um, it's it's a bit um, of a double-edged sword. Like I would get uh, attacks that would affect Fashion Valley, you know, um, or, or vice versa. When the website crashes a few years back, um, I would get scolded as well. Like it would be, I would be posting a picture of, of my son, but the, the the comments are like, you know, if you don't know how to set up a website, don't set up a website. <laughs> you know, um, and 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 um, the bigger you get, the more uh, attention you garner, uh, the more haters you get as well, right? So I've been called so many things, you know, like, um, you know, uh, and, and they get really personal, uh, and and for me. I think uh, there's al I always remind myself there's always the good and bad in everything, but looking at the bigger picture, the good just outweighs the bad. So you know, just gotta just gotta take it as it comes. Uh. But I, I stay away from uh, responding or engaging in um, you know big social media fights because I, I really don't think that's the medium for you to you know solve problems. Yeah, I've, I've read a few screens back of your blog, and I feel like I know you now, Vivi. Um, congratulations on the latest edition. Um, well done. You look fantastic. Um, uh, he had a part as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, us guys are normally Thanks just on the wayside, right? But uh, advice when it comes to social media, right? Because it is a powerful tool for people who are starting out, especially in B2C like retail, right? What kind of advice can you give to entrepreneurs who, who need social media but who, can, who have to navigate between self and work? What kind of advice can you give? I mean, there are so many ways. Uh, there are some brands who don't use the founders um, to to front the brand. There are some brands who do. Um, there are celebrity brands that completely um, uh, front the brands, right? So, um, I I'd say just do what suits you. If you don't mind being at the front, go ahead. Because uh, I gotta admit, it's always easier when there's a face to it, um, and people trust you instantly, especially if they followed you. You know. Um, they, and, and Malaysians, being Malaysians, they always want to know who's behind this brand, huh? Who, who's the owner? You know, so eventually they'll know. You know, and um, it's it's to me like uh, there's no right or wrong way. You just gotta do what fits you because there are some brands who try really hard to use a founder, but it just doesn't work because the founder doesn't like to be out. You know, the founder's um, an introvert, right? So don't want to be fronting the brand. So I think um, you can't follow people. People can smell fakeness, you know, people can smell if you're not authentic. So um, if, you're, if you're cool with being at the front, go ahead and use it all the way. And later when you come, when you scale, you think like, how is it that I'm going to uh, scale this brand further? Should I still use me? Because it's not scalable if you want to go global. You know, for me, I can front the brand for a few years here. But when we go to Middle East, when we go to the UK, when we go to, to the US, who's Vivi? Right? So... The brand itself has to be strong on its own. The founder is just a bonus. But I, I also have to add that, yeah, you know, different social media channels have different uh, users, right? And, and I think, you know, when you think about Instagram, it's a very clean and polished uh, look, right? Now, even when, pe when you have reels, you know, people are trying to be a bit more authentic, but you know it's, it's been more polished, it's been Photoshop. When you compare it to TikTok, it's completely authentic, right? It's like, I just got out of the shower and literally I just got out of the shower and I'm doing a dance now. So, you know, you I think... <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just imagining I, I, you I now. To, <laughs> it's, it's part of the job I can't, to I see, stay I can't up see that date. anymore, Faza. Sorry. <laughs> it's part of the job. Um, but yeah, you know, I completely agree with Vivi that you know authenticity is the number one thing on social media, and I think when you're a small business, definitely using a founder and a personality to back that adds more depth to the business and adds a lot more emotion between the customers and the business. Um, but I think as you grow larger, you need to figure out how do you start phasing out those qualities that the founder put into the brand 
to for the brand itself to stand alone and for the founder to eventually eventually step back because you know the as much as the the founder is the brand you can't replicate the founder so if you want to go into many many countries a it might not be as appealing and b you know she just can't be in in so many different places at the same time easy to say hard to do right because the ethos the lifeblood of the founder for that to transmit into the brand is a very difficult process only a few brands have done it i mean in my in my kind of like pop culture references anita rodek with uh, body shop um jenny versace with versace you know people like that and th they live on in the brands and the designs right how do you do that how do you get the transition going what are the things that you're doing well number one is to not the to not name the brand with your name I knew that from the start. It wasn't like going to be Vivi Scarves. <laughs> I don't think that would have flown lah, you know. So, um, the, the, the simplest thing, the name cannot be your name. To me lah. But that's right? not about the Versace. I mean, you know, the Versace. Yeah, but when I see is. Versace, I, I, I see Jenny Versace or, or Donatella, right? So, I still associate, you know, but um, I think when 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 you name it to your brand, it's very hard to detach, you know. It's so, you're a key person um, and people, unless you're already established, like you know, a few decades in the market, then people, people don't even know who who the who the founder is anymore. You know, so that's fine. But when you're starting out, the moment there's your name attached, you have to be at every event. You have to be be at every product launch. You know, um, so for me, I always told him like, the real success of of Duck is when I no longer have to promote it on my Instagram. You know, that means I know the brand is already strong on its own. Um, so even when we started out Duck, I made sure the branding was different, the niche was different, um, the packaging, the, 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 the distinctiveness of the brand is there, uh, the values of the brand is there. With or without Vivi, the brand is already strong on its own. So, so that's what, that's what um, I think every brand needs, um, a niche, a strong branding, and that, that X factor, you know, so so just me talking about it is just a bonus. Yeah, what the other thing that's quite unique about the both of you is that you're husband and wife, and husband uh, a husband and wife creative team running a retail business. That's bloody tough, man. You know what I mean? Um, Donatella and Jenny were brothers and sisters, but that's a different thing. Um, Faza, how do you navigate that? <laughs> <laughs> Are you oh, okay? Thanks, you thanks for <laughs> putting me on you the know. spot there. Uh, um, yeah, I, you know, I think at the in the beginnings, um, it was uh, very easy, right? It was very easy because when you're a startup, everybody does everything, and everybody almost naturally falls into where they are strongest, right? And so building up the business was was pretty simple. It was you know when we were getting into that, okay, we're now going from ten million to a hundred million stage, where you know we were also going from you know ten people to a hundred people. We we now had to decide. Okay, you know you have to take your part, and I have to take my part. So one of the things that Vivi and I started doing, you know, for uh, for a few years now, is we would have our own. We 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 always have company offsites with senior management, and one thing we did was we would have a husband and wife offsite, and so this was where we talk about our personal goals, our family goals, our business and, and uh, professional goals. And the topic was always, what do we see our strengths in FV? And we would give feedback to each other on how we thought we were both doing in FV. And sometimes it would be pretty brutal, right? We have to like <laughs> make sure that nobody else hears it because, I mean, we were always very careful to take care of each other's image in front of other people. I think that for us was very important because we don't want to air dirty laundry in front of other people. And it was really important for us also to seem to behave professionally in front of uh, people. So we came up with a few rules. You know, we uh, we gave our we gave specific areas of responsibility. We also said if there was a deadlock between us, only one person has to have the veto, right? And so only one person does have the veto, and that's something that we both accept. You know, even if the other person doesn't um, agree, we just have to move on and 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 decide how to make it work. So, I have to admit that the running the business as husband and wife, we complemented each other. One of the most difficult things for me personally was 
uh, the fact that BV was very uh, heavy in social media. And especially when there was a lot of scrutiny happening, you know, to Vivi uh, personally, or even uh, when the business was, you know, uh, under scrutiny, it was um, very difficult to make the right decision for the business, but also make the right decision to your, for your wife, right? So you can imagine that it's it's a tough one, right? And so I think that's when we we that's I think you know this is really how open Vivi and I are in our relationship. And I told her, I said that, you know, I, it's so hard for me to be CEO and husband. So we need to figure out a way where I just remove myself from making this decision of, you know, what you do or, or how the company behaves. And I think that's where both of us agreed, you know, there were some processes that needed to be in place where I wasn't involved in the decision making. You know, we got a third party company to come in, we got board members to be involved. You know, so we made sure that whatever we, uh, we, we made sure that the parts where it was difficult to merge the, um, the, the uh, co-founders and the husband and wife uh, elements that we had a process in place where it was the decisions were professionally done. Yeah, so the mechanisms are so important. And I think so far, it seems to have worked out really well. We but feel then, like each other. Yeah, I can tell. I mean, you know, the chemistry is evident from the word go. So but also at home, like, obviously you bring some work stresses home and all that. So I have to admit, like, there's no such thing as 6pm, we just don't talk about work. Lah. Definitely, like, dinner time also, we talk about work. We even share it with our kids. So our kids are also involved. They know, like, you know, if we had a bad day and they, they're so smart. They will give us suggestions, you know. So, <laughs> you know, so it, it, it becomes like a family discussion, which, which to me is really fulfilling and really fun to, uh, to, to teach our kids that these are the real world problems that mommy and daddy are facing, right? But between each other, we have this rule as well that we can never go to sleep angry at each other. Yeah, our, our kids are actually quite brutal because we would tell them that we have you know, problems in certain parts uh, of the business and they would just tell us, well, it sounds like that person isn't doing well. Why don't you get a new person? <laughs> You're like, yeah, huh? <laughs> you know, or, or like I would say, you know, we, we have factory in China and like China's stuck in, in the ports and all that. And then my daughter would be like, why don't you just produce here? Like, why do you have to? And I'm like, huh? Yeah. It's so, it's like, it's so easy, you know? Yeah. But, but yeah. I think uh, husband and wife, you know, you really have to support each other. You have to have some rules. Um, things cannot drag. So that's why I like put that rule. Whatever it is, we have to settle, settle before we sleep. Yeah, so it seems that between the two of you, the more important priority appears to be the both of you, beyond the business. Is, would that be a correct assumption? Yes. Correct. Above and beyond everything else, right? Um, so, so the additional complication is the fact that you both are still very young and you've, still, and you've got, f what, four very young children? Last we checked, four. Yeah. four last we checked. We're done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> could, could be five, but you, know, you never know. Um, how do you deal with that? Because the business takes so much time between the two of you, you need, you need some new time as well. And then you've got the kids as well. And it's so tough. I've had, I've had two and they're like five. F four is like having nine. <laughs> right? No, I'm not kidding, right? You know, they're not easy. So how, how, I, yeah, I think we, we both are very, very similar in the sense that we agree that our kids should see us work. Right? We, we don't um, overly coddle, coddle them. We don't, you know, try and, you know... Uh, constantly be there for them. We, we want them to be independent as much as possible. And we want them to know that, you know, mommy and daddy go to work. And because we go to work, that's why you get all these luxuries in your life, right? And so you, and that's also why we share with them. We tell them that we're going through challenges. But I think at the same time, we also do um, make sure that, you know, we allocate the right timing for uh, for the family, and I think this is where um, planning comes in. And a lot of people talk about work-life balance, and this is something that Vivi and I talk about as well. But you know, for most people, when they think about work-life balance, it's almost as if I gotta have it every day. I gotta go home by six o'clock. I gotta have like dinner with my parents. It's but you know, when you take work-life balance over a period of a year, it's a lot easier to achieve. Because now you can have you know, a week off every quarter with the family. You can have a monthly date night, 
right? There's no pressure to say that, oh, just because you missed yesterday, now I, I'm, I'm, I have so much pressure to go and see my parents today, right? So I think we, we do a lot of those planning and we actually tell the kids so they have something to look forward to as well. I think for me, being, you know, a mom, it's more like the kids usually, you know, need mommy, especially now, like, you know, I'm still breastfeeding, I'm still, but I still want to travel, I need to go see my UK team. It's, it's tough, right? Um, so I really think one is to have a sense of humour. Like, today we forgot to order lunch for the kids, you know? <laughs> and we're like, ha we forgot to order lunch, can you do it, you know? So, um, just ha not to take everything so seriously and not want to be perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect working mom. Some days you're going to slip up. Some days you're going to be awesome, right? Um, so, I've seen moms who, who come back to work and they're so upset because they're new moms, they're excited about their newborn and they feel like to be a good mom, you've got to be there constantly. You know, you've got to be there every day. You've got to watch every first, you know, first, first concert, first step, first roll, roll over, everything, you know. So, to me, I, I don't know who put that expectation, but I don't put that expectation on myself, you know, because to me, okay, I'm going to be a working mom. Some, some days I'm not going to be there, you know, and my kids understand. We, we make them, you know, understand what mommy and daddy do. Um, so, I really rely on support system. You know, we have helper, we have our moms, and, and when we're busy at work, it's always like, mom, can you help me out? They're like, uh, mom, can you help me out? You know, and, and they're always happy to, to do so. So, I feel like women who don't ask for help is only, it's not gonna, you're, you're gonna go insane. You know, you gotta reach out for help to, uh, from, uh, from your loved ones. Yeah, um, and in 20 years time, that's your, that's your management team because they know the business from, <laughs> they know it's <laughs> from the word go. Um, and I don't say that, you know, jokingly as well because they know the business, they, they can feel it in both of you. But then at the same time as well, you, you've, I, I guess part of the differentiators for you guys, if you've got, you've got your own brands as well, right? And the creative process must, must be so difficult because you've got to stay ahead of the curve, right? How would you address that? How would you approach uh, creativity and, and staying ahead of designs and design trends, consumption patterns, things like that? Yeah. For a fashion business like us, creativity is, is key, right? It starts from the product. So um, I, I, I'm in charge of the cre creatives team. And we always encourage each other to learn and read. Um, and we have this really unique um, uh, value at Fashion Valley Group. We call it SpongeBob. So we, we always have to be a SpongeBob. SpongeBob is uh, our learning session where we would get people from outside to come give talks or we would watch movies together about our brands. Um, we, would, we would learn, we would go to factories together. We went to the Royal Slango factory. Um, they welcomed us there. We watched how they make things. So all this kind of builds up uh, inspiration, creativity. Uh, it's, it's, it's fashion industry is so fast paced that it's nonstop. So, Burnout happens all the time, right? So we need to keep, you know, um, uh, encouraging them. We need to keep seeing the world. So during the pandemic, it was really hard to get everybody um, always be creative, creative. You're, you're within four walls, right? So um, it was a really tough time for my creative team because everyone's just not inspired, right? So um, we have this session also in Fashion Valley called What in the World? So What in the World is where uh, we get our team um, about maybe uh, eight people during that one session and they each present something that's happening around the world. Uh, whatever is dear to them, right? So um, uh, this, this guy can be talking about, uh, I learned this brand, Rafa, like this cycling, cycling brand. So he's very into cycling. So he shared about what, what's important to him. And then another, another team member would share about uh, uh, Selena Gomez's new, new beauty brand. Or somebody else uh, would share about Air Jordans. You know? So this kind of uh, does two things. One is to strengthen the team bond. Another thing is to wet the creative mind, you know, to see what's out there. Because when you're burned out, it really helps to see the world and just see what everyone else is doing to inspire you again. Yeah. And it is, is it a big addressable market? Because, like, I mean, Asia is just starting to wake up. Um, ASEAN is, what, 650 million people. That must be part of the PLY fundraising. Must have been very, very interesting for both of you. Yeah, so our, our business now is uh, focused on modest fashion. Right, so we we look at modest fashion uh, in two ways. One is um, the there's a large Muslim market around the world, and 
this is one of the fastest growing markets. And so for countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, you know, countries in the Middle East, we are all Muslim majority countries. And I think you know there isn't a single large player that is focusing just on modest fashion. If you ask anyone wearing a hijab today, you know you can walk into Zara, you can walk into H and M, you can buy things there, but you have to sift through a lot, right? And many times when you pick up something, you realize that actually it's not suitable for you. So that's one market where we see that there's a huge potential. But the on the flip side of it, you know because of the political situations in the last two decades, you see that there are a lot of Muslim minorities in Western countries. And these communities are also growing and they're moving up uh, the, uh, the, the income ladder. And they are significantly underserved in those markets. And so for us, we realized that, you know, we've built a great brand here. It's built upon the fact that you are a proud hijabi and, you know, building um, your you're proud to uh, to dress modestly, and so there's that opportunity for us to make this a global brand. So, how do you convince investors that you can translate your secret sauce, that the sauce that works so well in Malaysia, and you can translate that into the UK, you can translate that into you know um, into the US, for example, where there must also be quite a sizable proportion of of an addressable market. Yeah, that that that's a great question, and I think that is. The, one of the biggest challenges because when you talk about modest fashion, it is, you know, even between Malaysia and Indonesia, we look very similar, but culturally is very different. And even more so, the things that um, uh, that make it easy here to wear a hijab, right? I mean, we're a majority Muslim country. You can wear a white hijab or you can wear the brightest hijab and walk into the mall and you, there's no issue. But if you were to wear that same, you know, loud hijab walking down, you know, Al in Alabama, you're you're scared for your own safety, and that's where we see that you know there is that opportunity to serve those communities, and the the angle has to be different. You almost have to be more of an activist where you try to blend in but make the community understand, you know, what it is to be a hijabi. And so I think the, this is the the big dilemma, and that's why we split it up into the majority and the minority communities. Okay, what is what do you mean by that? Because okay, I think every one of us in this room and watching, you know, in cyberspace wants you to become uh, a Malaysian unicorn in in the fashion space, right? Uh, no question. Um, we we want to see you tr tr transcend those boundaries, right? But you've got to be able to get there and, and deliver there. So what kind of metrics? Um, would, would, would convince you to set up like a production center in, in say, the UK? Because right now, I'm, I'm sure your production is here mm -hmm. and you're sending stuff abroad, right? I, I, I presume. Yeah. But it's got to come to a point where it's going to be easier for you to fulfill there and deliver there and return there as well. And you want to be a global business, right? Yeah. So what, what kind of metrics are you watching? Yeah, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, uh, average order values. We're looking at cost per order. You know, we, we do realize that for um, for Western countries, the average order value is significantly higher, but the cost per order for us to ship items from you know Malaysia to to the UK is significantly higher as well. So I think before we even set up a, a facility in the UK or somewhere in Europe, we have to make sure that the business there is at a certain scale, so that when we make that investment into a fulfillment facility, that cost per order comes down but it is at a scale where the business as a whole is also profitable. So I think we're very, we've, over the last couple of years, we've uh, adjusted the business in a way where um, it's more profitable. We've uh, converted our business from you know, uh, selling third party brands and our private label brands to just our own brands. So we've seen margins go up you know, from 30% to 50% in the last three years. So. What what we're uh, what we're doing now is we're um, taking a profitable business in Malaysia and funding the expansion overseas. But we also realize that you know generally Malay Malaysian investors and you know I, I guess um, I yeah Malaysian investors like are on the risk adverse side, right? 
we want to see profits very quickly. And I think also for us, when we got institutional investors in Malaysia, we, that, was, that was our goal, to show the, the investors that this uh, business could be profitable. And we've shown that in the last couple of years, but now we're also saying that, yeah, it's profitable, but it's not the scale that we all want it to be. And for us to want it to grow a lot faster, we have to be comfortable with the risk and we have to be comfortable with reduced margins so that we can capture a much bigger market share, get to that point, and then figure out where are the areas where we can uh, bring down costs. How much of that risk and how much of that expansion ties in with the innovation side? I mean, there's this huge push towards sustainability, sustainable materials, um, you know, recycling. Um, do investors care about these things? Does the, does the customer pay for these things? And does it dovetail? Yeah, uh, I think investors care very much about these things. They are looking at um, the new... Uh, the new kind of brands that care about sustainability, doing good for the community. To me, sustainability is just doing good. Lah. Whether it's doing good to the planet, doing good to communities, um, doing good to, to the employees as well. Um, so for product side, um, we, it, it, it happened because of social media actually. Um, so I, a few, a few Ramadans ago, you know Ramadan, we have the Ramadan Bazaar and all that. So we would go to the Ramadan Bazaar and um, I... I would buy, you know, the food and they would give him plastic, right? So uh, our car was just filled with plastic, bags. plastic bags. And that went on social media and people were just bashing me like, you know, what, you know, be a responsible person, don't use plastic, you know, reduce your plastic, this is embarrassing, you're a public figure. Um, so that hit me hard because I was ashamed. I was like, why didn't I think of this earlier? Like, absolutely, you know, so sometimes being called out on social media is good for you, right? So from then, I just immediately switched. Suddenly, like, um, we did a recycling program um, at Doug where uh, they, because we're premium, so so uh, packaging is one of our biggest things. You know, we need to have nice packaging. So we would uh, do a recycling program. You can send back your Doug boxes. Um, and then we, we also introduce things like shopping bags to reduce your plastic bag uh, usage. Uh, we, we would uh, introduce products like water tumblers. And then it went on bigger. Like suddenly we would, uh, we would discover new materials like recycled plastic can be made into scarves. You know, wood pulp those uh, trees can be made into fabric scarves um, and and uh, it got really exciting you know so and and because of social media as well you're accessible to to uh, suppliers to new technology and um, you would discover them just on Instagram right so um, that's what uh, like like last month we launched our sports line and the whole sports line um, hijab was made from coffee waste you know, so it was so so interesting, and I can see that investors are really excited about this. Malaysia is always a little bit behind on caring about these sustainable um, things, but I think that's why we have to well, I, we have to be the trendsetter, right, in the fashion industry. Like all these things matter, and it's our responsibility to educate people and to give them the option. This is the more sustainable route. Our challenge is just to keep costs because sustainable things are more expensive um, in cost so it translates to the price so that's our struggle right now trying to bring costs down so now that you guys are up there you're, you're trailblazers you're top of the, the pile right how are you helping like the ecosystem you know the, the you know the small struggling designers you know the, the guys who, who, where, where you were 12 years ago you know, how, how do you help them? Yeah, I, mean, I, I love that, right? So, Because to me, community is so important. So we do a lot of collaborations. Um, during the pandemic, we, uh, we collaborated with mural artists um, who, who did not have income during, during um, lockdown and all that, right? So we, we actually, uh, we have our shopping bags and we would, uh, they would paint on our shopping bags and we, um, we featured them, you know, we... we, uh, we uh, promoted them and these bags sold out in in three minutes you know so so it's it's just so so exciting like just because you're one brand doesn't mean you cannot collaborate with all all um, other brands around you whether small or big right um yeah and and uh, like Lilith for example we did uh, a collaboration with Nurita Harith with um, more to come uh, all the designers around Malaysia and also outside of Malaysia so I think collaboration is just so important 
So that's interesting. I, I didn't know that you could make scarves out of like recycled plastics. I mean, in, uh, are they comfortable in the first place? <laughs> just it, um, it, it feels exactly like you wouldn't know. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So so so, so actually, part of the um, the one of our goals for sustainability is to give customers the alternative uh, product. So if we were previously you know selling set, satin silk, we would look for the exact same material, but made from recycled materials or made from, like Vivi said, coffee waste, you know, uh, more sustainable uh, method. Yeah, so one of the good things about f finance and markets having a say in terms of how the whole sustainability agenda is going, it's kind of like a, it's, it, it drives valuations, it drives prices, it drives value, right? So in terms of your fundraising rounds and, you know, Fazai, maybe you're leading this outside there in terms of business side, um, how how has Vivi, Vivi's work in sustainability driven you know the value of the business, uh, you know, in the bigger market horizon? Has it? You mean for this fundraising round? Yeah, I mean I'm sure because well, because yeah, you've um, got to be compatible. So so what what I can say about this fundraising round is that we're still in the early stages, but um, you know we sustainability plays a huge part in our roadmap, and we need to let investors know that this is an investment. Because again, you know, um, investors want to be part of the story, but they also are uh, financial investors, and they want to make sure that those returns are quick. Now, the challenge with uh, sustainability is, uh, or rather, moving into sustainable materials, is that a they, their cost is not lower. In many situations, the cost is higher, but on the other hand, the the scale of production is also not as high. Right, so so anyone who's saying that they're going to go fully sustainable within the next five years, I mean, it's probably not a very big business, right? So we so we we are going out there and we're we're talking about you know how sustainability uh, plays into our roadmap, but we also need to let those investors know that the that this is an ecosystem that needs to be developed, you know, not just by us but by many players that eventually will build up the, uh, the industry. Okay, so you're on the verge of, or you're soon going to close your fundraising. Um, what's the next five years hold? What does that entail? Is it, is it, a, is it a public listing? Um, is it Hong Kong? Is it you know, the US? Is it Malaysia? Um, is it an exit? Uh, do you hand over to professional management? You know, uh, what do you guys do? What's the next five years hold? How, and how big, I think most importantly, how big are you going to be? Yeah, I, I mean, we. Had our husband and yeah, wife we, last week. Yeah, literally, <laughs> we, we, we had this discussion. Okay, come on, and, uh, let's, have, let's have a bit of those. Uh. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I think Vivi and I, we realized that, you know, we've been in this business for 12 years now, right? And we, um, w if you ask either of us, the biggest challenge has always been uh, man management. I mean, we can dream, you know, and we can, we love the process of building up. Uh, operations for me. Vivi loves the creative process. Um, but, you know, we've started this from the time we left university. And we've hired up to today, we must have hired over, you know, 600 people over the last, uh, uh, last decade. And what we realized is, you know, when we first started off, we would hire people who are passionate and we would work alongside them. Then we would hire managers and we would work alongside them. And today, we have to hire managers of managers, and sometimes even directors, who tell us what, what to do. And one thing that nobody ever teaches you is, how do you go from you know, managing other executives and working side by side with them, to now managing managers and directors and other C-level people? And so that's one of the biggest challenges that Vivi and I have had. Uh, while building the business, and I think we re and we realize that you know it's probably time for us to bring in more professional managers into the business. We've done a bit of that in the last uh, couple of years, but I think our ambitions and the scale that we want to grow the business, you know, we're looking at you know a hundred stores over the next um, over the next three years. We're also looking at you know building out technology to be able to power a lot of innovative customer experience. We're looking at you know sustainable. Uh, materials within the products. So all of these things, you know, we can dream it, 
but we need to we we need to bring in professional managers who can manage the the guys on the ground you know because if we do that we'll burn out you know within weeks right yeah a fantastic fantastic answer vivi uh, fadza it was an honor and a privilege to talk, to talk to both of you and to talk about your story i will recall this moment in time to come when you're on the front page of the of, the, of fortune magazine wow. having raised 10 billion dollars in an ipo i said i was there i spoke to them in person so thank you and good luck with right. the journey thank as you it so goes. much thank, thank you everybody you